the session is uh, Surag Nair. So it's one of our uh, proceedings presentations and it's on uh, predicting uh, genome-wide accessibility across cellular context. Thanks. And just for upstairs, he's going to use the podium mic. Hello, hi. Um, awesome. So I'm Surag Nair. I work with Anshul Kandalji at Stanford. And I'm going to talk about our work on predicting genome wide chromatin accessibility across cellular contexts um, by integrating DNA sequence and gene expression data. This work was done with a lot of help by uh, Daniel Kim and Jacob Pericone. Okay, so DNA seq and attack seq across diverse cellular contexts and tissues have revealed millions of putative regulatory elements, and many of these elements have dynamic patterns of accessibility across these different cellular contexts. Um, for a given cellular context uh, and a given genomic regulatory element, the chromatin accessibility primarily depends on two main factors. The first is the presence of cis regulatory features. That's the um, many of which may combine to give rise to very complex uh, motif dramas. And secondly, the availability and activity of trans factors um, in that cellular context. So the goal for our project was to develop a model that can predict genome-wide chromatin accessibility um, from two things, from the DNA sequence and from the RNA expression of trans regulatory factors. And once we have a model that can do this, we can then impute chromatin accessibility for data sets that are characterized um, only by RNA-seq, and an example of such a data set is recount2. And once we do this, we can then derive insights. We can probe this model. We can try to interpret it and ask questions and try to derive insights into the cis-regulatory sequence features as well as trans-regulatory features that are predictive of chromatin accessibility. So consider the following matrix, uh, which has loci on one axis and cell types on another, and each element of this matrix essentially is an indicator of chromatin accessibility at that locus in that given cell type. In our case, we use binary chromatin accessibility, and so each element is either one or zero, depending on whether chromatin is accessible at that locus in that cell type. Now, a lot of recent work has focused on sequence-only models. Um, and examples of such models are DeepC by Zhao, um, Bassett, and Basenji by Kelly. And for the purposes of evaluation, what these models tend to do is split this matrix um, along the locus dimension. And so typically what happens is that a few chromosomes are held out um, as, as a test set for evaluation. These sequence-only models come in two flavors. The first is um, the case when the sequence is mapped to chromatin accessibility across all the cell types in this, in this matrix. And the second case is when instead of having a single model, you have multiple models, one for each, um, each, each column in this matrix, and each model predicts the chromatin accessibility for its cell type. Now, main caveat of these models, of sequence-only models, <coughs> is that they cannot be used to make predictions in cellular contexts outside of this matrix by which I mean that they cannot be used to make predictions um, in cellular contexts that they have not seen during training time. And so this limits the, the applicability, the usability of such models. However, if you add an extra modality of data, such as RNA expression, and note that this RNA expression provides a useful surrogate for the activity of trans factors, we see that we can now split this matrix in more interesting ways. In fact, we can hold out entire cell types um, in our test set, which means that we can predict genome-wide chromatin accessibility profiles for cellular contexts that we have not seen during our training time. And so this formulation has been used previously by Nuuk in the BioArchive paper and by Zhao in the Nature Communications paper. I'll be talking about these um, soon. Um, and so we build on top of this, and essentially the crux of our problem is to predict chromatin accessibility at a given locus in a given cellular context from a thousand base pair sequence at that locus and the expression of around 1,600 transcription factors in that cellular context. 
So we use a deep learning based method since deep learning architectures allow us the flexibility to integrate such multimodal data. In this case, we have um, DNA sequence coupled with RNA expression. And so let me just go over the architecture that we use quickly. We start with the one hot encoding of our DNA sequence and pass them through multiple convolution layers. At the end of this, we flatten the convolution layer to get a vector representation of our DNA sequence. Um, for those of you not extremely familiar with convolution networks, each convolution layer here can be assumed to be similar to a PWM filter, which is scanned across its input sequence. And between any two consecutive convolution layers, a nonlinear transformation is applied. Now note that this step is common also to sequence-only models. However, since we wish to integrate RNA expression data, we tag along, we append the RNA expression data to this vector representation of the sequence, and then pass this concatenated representation through further fully connected layers, at the end of which we obtain a single scalar, which represents the probability of the sequence being accessible in the cell type. And this is a fairly, so this is a fairly simple representation of our architecture in practice. We use over 15 convolution layers. And I mean, a critical issue when dealing with such deep networks is that training of these models can become highly inefficient. So a common way to mitigate, these, mitigate this issue is to introduce such skip connections, which are known as residual neural networks. So residual neural networks, residual layers, are characterized by such skip connections in which the input is added to the output of the convolution layer. Now, this might seem a fairly trivial transformation. It's a fairly simple solution. But in practice, it has been shown to um, help make training more efficient. We also use a transfer learning based approach to train our model in, model in two steps. In the first step, we train a sequence only model that maps the sequence to the chromatin accessibility of all the cell types in our training data set. In the second stage, we initialize um, the weights of our model with those learned in the first stage and then train a sequence and RNA expression um, model that maps this to the chromatin accessibility of this pair. Now you may see that the neural networks in this case are almost identical. And when we wish to perform training on these networks, we, um, a single training step would entail a forward and a backward propagation. The time taken in both of these networks is about the same. However, in the first stage, the model is able to learn from all the training cell types in a single training iteration. Whereas in the second case, um, it's only able to learn from one at a time. So we hope that this transfer learning approach speeds up training and uh, makes training more efficient. And indeed, empirically, we do observe that our stage two loss is much lower and also um, reduces much more quicker uh, in the case in which we pre-train our model with, train with stage one training. Before moving ahead, I also want to show you a quick and simple baseline that works surprisingly well despite not uh, having any fancy machinery. Now, if you discard the RNA expression data as well as all sequence data, we can choose a locus and compute the mean accessibility at that locus. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, consider an example in which we have 10 training cell types and four test cell types. And at a given locus, um, the Compton accessibility values across all training cell types are, uh, are as follows. We have three cell types in which Compton is accessible and seven in which it is not. And so the mean accessibility in this case is 3 over 10, which is 0.3. So we attribute the same value, the value 0.3, to all of the cell types in our test set. And if you do this across all loci, we can get a predicted matrix that looks somewhat like this. Now note that this is a fairly dumb and a cell type agnostic baseline, and yet does surprisingly well. So we leverage this insight to actually go back to our neural network architecture and modify it. Uh, this was the slide I'd shown you a couple of, uh, this was the architecture I'd shown you a couple of slides back. But we can modify this by adding the mean accessibility and providing it as a third input to our model. And shortly, I'll show you how this really improves predictive performance. Use a data set derived from the ENCODE project. And we have Crompton accessibility uh, for over 123 cell types with the matched RNA-seq data. And so as I showed you, uh, the mean baseline, we perform a five-fold cross-validation and present the results here. So the mean baseline um, achieves an AUPRC, which is an area under the precision recall curve of around 0.6. We then compare it to another non-deep learning baseline, which is bird again by the Zhao paper in Nature Communications 2017, and that beats the mean baseline. We then train two deep learning architectures. The first is what we call the factorized based on the paper by Anouk. And the second is the residual neural network architecture by us, which both of which um, perform better than the non-deep learning alternatives. Now, both of these models did not take the mean as an additional input. But the moment we provide the mean as an additional input, 
um, the models have a much higher predictive, um, much higher predictive performance. And in fact, the residual neural architecture with the mean outperforms um, all the other, all the other, all the other methods. And so the next step really is to interpret these models and to investigate whether the features that are being learned uh, make sense biologically. And to do this, we start by computing what we call importance scores. Um, computing importance scores for models is akin to asking the question, how should I change each base pair of my input in order to increase the probability that a sequence is accessible? And so since deep learning networks are differentiable, they provide us with a cheap solution to do this. Um, the simplest method in the method we use is to compute the derivative of the output with respect to the input, with respect to each input base pair. And so that looks somewhat like this for a bunch of, for a bunch of loci. We can see important scores attributed to each base pair. In our analysis, we fix a cell type, and then we sample a bunch of loci at which it is accessible, and then compute these important scores. We next pass it to a method called TFMUDISCO, developed by Avanti in our lab, which essentially transforms these important scores into high-quality motifs. So the way it works at a high level is as follows. Let's say we have a cell type with only three accessible loci at which we compute these important scores. We then pass these to TFMODISCO, which first computes the most important subsequences. It then clusters these subsequences um, based on similarity, and then consolidates these subsequences to, to, to output high quality motifs. Uh, we can then match these motifs against a database of known motifs to make the following matrix. Uh, we have a matrix which has these motifs on one axis and the cell type on another. And we see that the model learns um, non-specific as well as cell type specific cis regulatory sequence features. For example, we see that the model picks out CDCF as a marker of um, open chromatin in, in almost all cell types. Um, we see cell type specific clusters such as that for kidneys in which we see 6.2 and GRHL2 which are known um, regulators in kidney. We also see twist one be, being picked out for muscle cells and factors such as RUNX1, IRF1, ETS1 in the case of hematopoietic cells. So we next intersect these discovered motifs with the RNA expression profiles of their transcription factors. In this case, we pick out those transcription factors for which um, the pattern of motif presence correlates strongly with the pattern of gene expression. And a lot of these in, indeed do have uh, a high similarity between their patterns. And we see that this could potentially lead to um, match linking these transcription factors to the motifs that they bind. Finally, we impute accessibility profiles for 250 additional cellular contexts for which we did not have the DNA-seq data, but we had the RNA-seq. Um, and we perform a clustering based on these imputed accessibility profiles. And we see that clustering based, based on the predicted accessibility is in general cleaner um, and more biologically meaningful than clustering based on just the transcription factors. A good example of that is if you look at this small cluster which has adenocarcinomas highlighted in orange. Um, the adenocarcinomas are much clearly separated in the case of um, predicted accessibility than the case of transcription factors. Um, and this is particularly insightful and interesting in light of the fact that adenocarcinomas were not present in the 123 training cell types. So in conclusion, we see that deep learning models can be used to accurately predict um, chromatin accessi accessibility profiles in new cellular contexts. We can then interpret these models, probe them to see um, what cis regulatory uh, sequence fact, uh, what cis regulatory elements the model is picking up, which can then be linked um, to the expression dynamics of the corresponding transcription factors. We can also, uh, we also see that the imputed accessibility profiles capture meaningful differences biologically um, and lead to meaningful segregation uh, in a clustered space. Uh, thank you. So. We're somehow miraculously roughly on time, so we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, really could work. Um, I was really impressed by the, the bump, the jump that you get when you introduce yeah. simply the mean. Uh -huh. uh, have you tried to also uh, introduce maybe the variance? Because that would also give you a range around which you are to expect the value to be, right? And if, because if it's, if it's also giving that much of a jump, then you are getting closer to one, right? Yeah, no, that's pretty interesting. We haven't actually tried using the variance, but it would definitely be interesting to try it out. Thanks. Um, how did you arrive at the architecture? Because the setup seemed a bit like handcrafted, like there were choices made, you know. Yeah. It, 
in yeah, a very so yeah, a lot of ground decisions, up way. Yeah, so a lot of the decisions were actually based on the uh, Nook paper, which came out, which attempted a fairly similar problem. Um, they had made some decisions along the way that we followed, uh, and since they had done a fairly in-depth search of their architectures, um, and then we also handcraft, we tried out a bunch of other designs and saw what, what worked for us. Okay, so in the end, when you did that benchmark with your own architecture search, this one was still better. That's right. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. I have a quick question. Yeah. Actually, I didn't get this, that you add the mean. Can you say, explain again? Because you're predicting chromatin accessibility, and now you add the mean of chromatin yeah. accessibility. I got really confused. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so the general scenario is, uh, well, if you go back to our matrices, um, we have a bunch of training, training cell types that we know about, and then we have thousands of tests, you know, test cell types that we do not know about. Now, it seems that it's very hard to predict this mean value from just the sequence alone. And so when we provide the sequence, when we provide the mean by just looking at all the cell types in our training data, it provides a good prior to the model. So um, okay. if, if, it's zero, yeah, if it's zero across all training cell types, then the model has a better idea that it's highly unlikely that um, this, in a new seller context, that this would be accessible. And so it would need something miraculous to happen or it needs some more information if it has to say that something is accessible. Um, hi. So, hi. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, so it wasn't clear to me. So the prediction that you are making is at a low psi level, but the expression uh, that you are using is more of a global feature. Yeah. And uh, and you are using the expression level of the transcription factors. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I guess maybe repeat the question. Uh, uh, so I was just wondering if you can just quickly say what is the information and. Yeah. Do, do you really uh, do you have to restrict yourself to TFs? Uh, can, can't you use uh, the entire expression matrix as a potential feature? No, so we do not have to restrict ourselves to just transcription factors. It was a decision choice that we made because um, essentially, if you look at this, we only have 123 distinct um, um, RNA seq vectors because we only have 123 distinct cell types in our training data. And so it is easier for the model if you restrict the dimension of these uh, 123. Um, of these RNA expression vectors. Um, using just transcription factors was a choice that we made. We can perhaps play around with it and see what works best. Um, and yes, the transcription factor gives you a notion of the cellular context, and so that would be the same across all the um, loci in this matrix. So for a given column, you'll have the same value of the transcription factor expressions. Um, and so it wouldn't vary with each loci, if that's what you're asking. Thanks, Surag, again.